this is going to be a demonstration of how you can leverage R, really how you can extend your knowledge into different domains. If you know uh, the tidyverse, then there's one practical example of how you can use tidyverse tools plus a few other packages to start gathering uh, Twitter data. There are slides in there. And just to show you where, if you download this, like with the download zip button after you click the green button, there's a directory in there called slides. And if you download and expand the file, uh, you can run index.html within that directory. I like to start by reading this land acknowledgement. So if you'll give me your attention for just a moment. Uh, Duke University sits on the ancestral land of the Shikori, the Eno, and the Catawba people. This institution of higher education is built on land stolen from those peoples. These tribes were here before the colonizers arrived. Additionally, this land has borne witness to over 400 years of the enslavement, torture, and systematic mistreatment of African people and their descendants. Recognizing this history is an honest attempt to break out beyond persistent patterns of colonization and to rewrite the erasure of indigenous and black peoples. There is value in acknowledging the history of our occupied spaces and places. I hope we can glimpse an understanding of these histories by recognizing the origins of our collective journeys. So that's a very serious thing. There are, very, there are other very serious things that have gone on in the news today. We're not gonna discuss those serious things going forward, but I hope that some of this information might help you fix some things or injustices that you see before you. In any case, today is a demonstration and the goals of the demonstration are to gather some tweets. In order to gather some tweets, we're gonna define what an API is and then talk about the Twitter development portal, which is a particular API access point. There is a way to request academic use of the Twitter development portal. We'll talk about that. We'll do some very rudimentary text analysis and visualization. Uh, I got one question from somebody specifically about visualizing um, geolocating tweets, and we will definitely talk about that. Um, and I will point out some useful documentation along the way. The, the one thing that I like to make really clear is that a lot of what happens when you analyze tweets falls under the category of text analysis. And text analysis is a very dynamic and um, changing field. I am not uh, a text an analyst expert. I don't pose as a text analyst expert. I'm just an R slash Twitter slash or R slash tidyverse enthusiast, and I'm trying to show you some practical tips on how you can get started. But uh, the reality is, is that there's a tremendous amount to learn when it comes to text analysis. And uh, I will try and point out some books, some free books that you can get online to help you get started. Uh, it's possible if you have done text analysis before that you know more than I do. Uh, so I just want to make that clear that we're really just, my goal here is just to demonstrate some useful R code and give you a starting point where you can take your research further. In terms of a starting point, uh, I like to point out that uh, I do a lot of R workshops, introduction to Tidyverse kinds of workshops. And so I'm gonna click on that link and go to R Fun in case you haven't seen it before. This is a sub-branded site for my center that focuses just on R. If I start to cover things that you don't recognize or need a little more, more background on, you can possibly get them from here. If you scroll down, there's a section called our workshops. You'll see different modules on lots of things. Like for example, we'll talk a little bit about mapping as we map Twitter geolocation data. There's more information there. We're gonna do some visualization, more information there. This quick start guide is really helpful. Uh, what I did in the last year is I flipped my introduction so that it would be more uh, convenient and useful in a COVID environment where none of us are meeting face to face. Uh, there's a maybe a maybe it's a 20 minute video right there, the quick start. There's maybe a 15 minute video right there on Deplier, which is all about reshaping data, getting it in a format where you can then analyze it. This is going to be really useful, as has been pointed out many times. 
documented in the New York Times at some point in an article that usually about 80% of any good data project is just about the normalization and cleaning and reshaping of data. That's what you would use Deplier for. Uh, there's a video here on ggplot. I want to bring to your attention this section right here in the middle. Uh, lots of things to learn more about in terms of assignments and pipes and joining and pivoting data, R markdown. There's a nice link right here that is to a playlist of all these short videos and you can play them at any time. Uh, in addition to that, I could give you even more pointers to other useful uh, learning materials for the tidyverse. But one that I'll just mention, you could go to your favorite search engine and put in the phrase RStudio primers. Uh, send me a link if you, send me an email if you need the actual link, but I think you'll find it. And that's a really nice interactive place to learn and, and uh, build up your R slash tidyverse skills. Okay, so going forward, uh, I'm going to start by talking about application program interfaces or APIs. And APIs have existed for a long, long time. They've existed before the web was a thing. And it really is essentially a way for a machine to talk to another machine to do a certain thing. Now, I bring this up because uh, if any of you were in my workshop a couple of weeks back, excuse me, where I talked about web scraping, which is really a form of screen scraping, a lot of people will come to me and they'll say, well, I want to scrape you know, some site, for example, Twitter, because it has a web front end and you can browse it through your web browser and use your mouse to scroll around. And that is technically something that you could possibly do, but most sites don't actually want you to use a robotic mechanical, or not mechanical, but a, a computer-based robot to scrape the web front end to their site. They want that to be the front door that's responsive to people who are clicking and browsing manually. As a result of that, there are other ways to get at the same data. There are literally thousands of APIs and you can usually Google. Uh, there are a couple of clearinghouse sites that will list APIs, but you can usually use a search engine. For example, if you wanted to find an API at the CDC site, you could just search, search that in your search engine, like CDC, COVID data, API, uh, maybe, maybe uh, financial data, anything like that. If there is a web front end, uh, I should say a big data source web front end, there is a good possibility that there's also an API for that site. You can think of, or I often do think of, of the API as kind of like the loading dock or the back door entrance, uh, right? Like if, if the web page is the front door, they want that to be pretty. They want everybody to walk through in the right kind of manner. And the API is really for bulk collection of data. Now, in a way, you do sort of the same stuff. If you were in that previous workshop where I was talking about web scraping, first you have to gather the data, you have to figure out how to traverse through the different options of the data to pull it back, and then you have to parse it to separate out the markup language from the text, or sometimes you want elements, attributes of the markup language. And a lot of times you're going to end up doing the same thing with an API. Uh, most APIs these days will ask you, well, first of all, you'll have to register with them. Almost all of them you have to register. They're not always, they don't all cost money. Some of them do. So the registration process is often free. You know, exists documentation there. Every API is going to be different. So you're going to have to look at that documentation, search for forums and places where people can give you help. Uh, but those, when you register, they'll give you your personal set of access keys. One of the keys you need to keep secret. So keep that in mind. If you're putting it in your code and you're putting your code up on GitHub, you want to make sure that you're not exposing your personal API key. Uh, the other key is, is more public. And so just that's something to keep in mind. Twitter is no different, right? They have a development portal. And you can apply for access to that development portal. Today, you won't actually need to apply to the development portal. If we, end up, if we get moved far enough along and we start using code, just your standard Twitter account should work. Um, Twitter rules about accessing their API through the development portal actually change pretty rapidly. And this is a relatively recent change. Uh, some of those rules are quite uh, inconvenient. For example, up until recently, you couldn't get very much historic data without paying some kind of fee. Very recently, uh, last couple months, they opened up a new uh, 
sort of policy channel to their portal that they call academic access. So you can write, you can create a Twitter account. You don't necessarily have to use your main Twitter account if you're a regular Twitter user and you can apply for that academic access. It's kind of exacting. Um, it, it's not gonna happen in, in two minutes or three minutes or five minutes. It can take a week. You have to fill out certain information. Just be very clear about what you're intending to do. You know, I'm collecting data for this research purpose. I'm gonna publish it or I'm not gonna publish it, whatever. Uh, and then keep close track on your email because that's the way they're going to respond. And then eventually they will give you access. So if I, let me just go to that link just so you can see it. There's the button that you would click to apply for access. Now you can see that I'm already logged into my Twitter account, which by the way, I really don't use that much, um, but I use it enough that it will be useful for today. Uh, this is a, a view of my, my view of the development portal. And you will notice that I have a couple of what are called uh, apps. I'm not gonna open them up because some of these probably have my keys in them and I don't wanna, I don't wanna open them up and expose that to the video and then have to go and edit that back out. But it's, that's the information that you may need if you have to go back beyond the standard thresholds that Twitter is gonna impose on you. And I also wanted to point out, let's see, I think it's right here. If we click on Twitter API, no, not that products, maybe products. Let me go back to my slide. Oh, it's right here. I just didn't, I just didn't see it up here at the top. You can see that I have a standard development portal access that I'm using. And I've also got this academic research portal and then there's, which I think I already applied for, but then there's this button here that says, get started. And when you click on that, you'll have the ability to, to fill out the forms to get yourself approved. And then you'll be able to do much more historic data research. Uh, your thresholds will be quite different. So I encourage you to do that. If you're just exploring for today, you're not gonna to need to do those things. And if you're intending to turn it into a research project, it will take a little bit of time. All right, so going back to uh, APIs, like again, the Twitter development portal is a, is a Twitter specific API. A lot of APIs return their data in what's called a JSON format, right? So JSON technically stands for JavaScript Object Notation. You don't have to know JavaScript in order to use it. What it is, is embedded uh, structure to the data that they return in a key value pair kind of format. So once you get this data back, if I wanted the first name value John, I would need to uh, parse through my data record, which starts with this open curly bracket and ends with this closed curly bracket and, and index on the key, which in this case is first name. So if I wanted age, the value, it, which is 25, I would have to index on age. Now there's a package here called JSON Lite. If you find that you're working with some, uh, some JSON data from some other API, you may need to use JSON Lite so that you can, uh, so that you can parse the JSON data effectively. Basically, the reason why people do this, why sites do this is because they can return large amounts of data to you with the data schema that's relevant to the record. And it's not quite as rigid as, for example, a relational database where every table is gonna to have to have the same fields. Uh, in a JSON file, if we take this example right here, there's a phone number key, which is in itself an array um, that has different types of phone numbers, home, office, and mobile. Um, I may have no phone numbers, in which case, technically, I wouldn't have to return that part at all for one record, or I may only have one phone number, and then I don't have to return an empty string where there's no home number or et cetera. Anyway, JSON is just a very flexible uh, data, um, what's the word I'm looking for, uh, data schema structure to talk about, to tell you what kind of data you're getting back. Um, now, fortunately, we're talking about Twitter here, so we're going to use this RTweet package. And as one of the things that RTweet will do for us is it will turn the JSON data into a data frame. So we can largely ignore this for today. 
but if you're accessing other APIs, uh, that will be useful information. All right, so our tweet is developed by this group called R Open Sci. Uh, they, they keep it up to date as up to date as possible. You can go to this link and that will give you access to the documentation on all the functions. Two particular uh, articles that are useful at that site. There's a sub menu that I think has the option of articles. Uh, one is obtaining using access tokens, right? So I talked about those tokens back here, these keys. You'll want to, you might want to double check that. And the other one is um, this very useful article on an introduction to Rtweet and collecting Twitter data. We're basically going basically to kind of run through that today. Uh, as I mentioned before, once you get the data back, you're going to want to do some kind of text analysis. Text analysis is a rapidly changing field, but the package that we'll use most likely, or that we'll use most today, is a package called TidyText. It was developed by Julia Silge and David Robinson. There's a free book called Text Mining with R that you can get to on the web, uh, which I find very helpful. It's concise, it's specific, it has some appendices, one appendix in particular, a case study on comparing Twitter archives that I would recommend to you. Um, another thing that I would recommend to you is the, this link right here to this site. SICSS stands for um, uh, Summer Institute for Computational Social Science. It is an institute that is the brainchild of Professor Chris Bale, who is in sociology department at Duke and uh, another professor up at Princeton, Matthew, I, I'm sorry, I don't remember exactly how to pronounce his last name, but if you go there, they have uh, in, under the curriculum section, they have several videos on text analysis. So beyond what I tell you today, they're gonna give you more of the theoretical background between that and text mining, that should give you a really solid start moving forward. I'll try and loosely introduce the topic as it relates to tweets, recognizing that, you know, when, when it comes to text analysis, that's a field that has been around for a while and it, you know, may have more typically dealt with documents, anything from books and novels to, you know, text coming out of NGOs and things like that. Tweets are yet a, a whole nother weird application of text analysis because the language tends to be more informal. There are a lot more abbreviations, there are hashtags, there are all kinds of things that make text analysis in Twitter, unique and challenging, but that's where I would, I would check out this case study and maybe some of this curriculum to, to get a better handle on some of the nuances. Having said that, uh, what I would like to do or invite you to do if you wanna code along with me is go to this GitHub site and um, download the code. And I'm just gonna go straight into my R Studio. Okay, so that what you should be seeing now is my my blue screen to our studio open to that repository that I showed you. And I'm going to start here in this file called uh, 01 gathertweets.rmd. And what we're going to do, let me do one or two things just to make it easier for you to see. Change the size of the appearance of the of the interface. And I don't really need this right hand part of our studio. So I'm just going to, I'm just going to expand full size this RMD document. There's some text and other links in here that you can read through. Um, the two packages that we need at the moment for gathering data are Tidyverse and Partweet. So I'll load those. I have the warnings turned off so it didn't actually respond to me. And uh, I see uh, Denny's here. Denny may have seen some of this before because I, I did a presentation very much like this uh, that he, he uh, organized. And um, in that, I, I uh, had recently become aware, this was just six months ago, I'm a little behind the times, but I'd recently become aware of this, this uh, K-pop group called BTS. So I wanted to see what I could learn about them and you know, many of you will know the, the group as well as the song Dynamite. Um, so what I'm doing here is I'm just searching on that hashtag and limiting the tweets to a thousand tweets and using the flag that says 
that I will I don't want any retweets, right? So I want only original tweets. And when I run that, uh, let's see what happens here. Okay, so the first thing it did is it popped me into the web browser and told me that it was authenticating and the authentication was complete. And so I can close that. You probably didn't see all that because of the way Zoom is um, working. But if you hadn't been logged into Twitter, you would probably have to log into Twitter. And then you would get a progress bar on what you're returning. So now I have uh, an object in my environment space called BTS Dynamic. And like I said, uh, because, because we're using the RTweet package, uh, we don't actually have to look at JSON data. We can get this data back in a data frame. So if I display this um, data frame, I have that thousand rows. And you'll also notice it's quite extensive, 90 columns. It's quite a bit. Um, it consists of some user IDs and some status IDs, and you can scroll to the right, but uh, just for the heck of it, rather than scroll to the right 90 columns, I'll use the glimpse command. Uh, just in case anybody didn't pick up what I just did there, I, I had taken that, um, I had removed the R designation from the opening code chunk just so I could not have to display this when I printed it out. And uh, I just hit a backspace, making that an active code chunk, and then I could execute that code chunk. And you can scroll through and see that, you know, for a great many of these variables, there's not any data. But there is quite a number of variables, including, for example, a thing called Bbox, which is coordinates that relate to uh, geographic uh, designations such as uh, geocords. You know, people have recorded them, there might be coordinates. If they haven't recorded them, there would not be. Um, all kinds of information here that you, it's almost mind boggling. Uh, but most people, a lot of times when they're talking about analyzing tweets, of course, want to get to the, to the tweet itself, which exists in a, field called or a variable name called text, right? So uh, I can't read that. Um, my friend from Brazil who's online here, probably maybe he can, although he speaks, he speaks Portuguese and I don't know what language that is, but um, in any case, that's not important. You, this is common. You will get um, all kinds of information back, could be in multiple languages, especially in a case like this. And you will occasionally get things like this that you see right here, which are UTF codes, I'm pretty certain. Um, and this is a, a big stumbling block with, um, with not only with text analysis in general in R, but, but tweets also, is that not everything comes back as, as text that's easy to read. And you'll have all kinds of codes that you have to clean up. And you're going to spend a fair amount of time Googling and you know, searching for ways to figure out what this UTF code is and whether or not you want to retain it or just drop it. Uh, we're not going to worry about those two th those things, but it's just something that you'll that you'll have to keep in mind and goes back to uh, what I was saying, right? Like Eighty percent of any data project is the data cleaning, and there's plenty of data cleaning when it comes to Twitter data. So. Um, if you want to code along with me, I would suggest to you put your cursor at the beginning of line 63 and hit a backspace and put in anything you want in that blank line and gather a tweet just to see how it works. In the meantime, I'm gonna read Brenda's question. Uh, she says, I once spent several days making a UTF code to emoji library. <laughs> if you have tips or resources on that, please do share. Um, yeah, um, I, I, don't, I don't have any doubt that you spent quite a bit of time on it. Um, I don't know that I have any tips, to be honest with you, but if you run into really, to a really specific problem like this and you haven't solved it, I'm happy to you know, help try and point you in the right directions. I have some ideas of how UTF works. I may know a little bit more than, than the average person, uh, but that particular problem right now off the top of my head, I don't know the answer to. All right, so there we have it. We've, we've gathered some data. Uh, I put mine in an object called BTS Dynamite. 
If you put in a search, you will also have an object called my gather tweets. And uh, this is a, a point worth mentioning is that if you're trying to collect data, a lot of times I'll tell people like the easy, well, this is this is a topic that has changed, right? I mentioned that the, the policy rules for, for accessing Twitter keep changing. And recently they changed them and gave a lot of a, a lot more permissions to the academic portal status that you have to apply to. Um, but prior to that, if you're just a standard person and you wanted to do a historical uh, analysis of some tweets, you really had only two options. One was to pay for historical access. And what was really annoying about that is you couldn't find a single site that would quote you a price. So you had to propose what historical search you wanted to, to search what the boundaries of the timeline were, and then get see if they were gonna charge you or maybe give it to you free because you're an academic or what, but there was no straightforward way. It felt like it felt a little uncomfortable, um, like you weren't being treated completely fairly. On the other hand, you could get the data for free and who can argue with that? Now that they have the academic status in theory, uh, you can do more historical tweets. The other way that you could do it was to anticipate what you were doing. So for example, if you're, going to do some, some analysis on the 2022 elections in the United States, you could start collecting your data now. In order to collect your data now, one of the things you're going to have to do is run that search, this function right here, on some serial basis. So you're going to have to have some computer that runs either in the cloud or off, in the, you know, the, off on the sidelines that's always running. And here are two... Um, mechanisms, there's probably a Mac mechanism where you can schedule your uh, R uh, scripts to run on a regular basis in the background. There's also a tool that I recently learned of called Apache Airflow. I don't know how it works, um, but all of those are things you're gonna need to keep in mind. If you're gathering data going forward and you wanna put it either in a database or some kind of data store, you need to run it on a regular basis. You're gonna have to run something like this um, on or doing some kind of scheduling task. So there are a couple RStudio um, instances that are up in the cloud that might make that even a little bit easier. But uh, in any case, keep that in mind. All right, so just further um, tour of the kinds of things that our tweet allows you to do. Like this is my Twitter handle right here. I don't, again, I don't use it a whole lot but I can use this get friends function and you'll see what it will return. Uh, this is going to tell me, I think, who I'm following. And if I, if I run that, this is what I get back, right? A two dimensional um, table that consists of the user, which is me and a bunch of user IDs and that's it. So then you have to do what's uh, essentially do what's called rehydrate, right? So I have to, take this user ID, which is unique to somebody that I'm following and kind of hydrate the information back on who that person is. One reason for that is because people can change their Twitter handle names, but from a database point of view, you wouldn't want that. The, the, just because I changed my name, I might change my name uh, for, for, I don't know, performance reasons, but that doesn't mean that my historical tweet uh, presentation necessarily should be lost. So that's why they assign an ID. Anyway, there's a useful, very useful um, function that can deal with that, right? I can send this whole vector user ID to a function called lookup users, which I'll do right now. And when I run that, I get back in this case, um, some more information. Uh, again, 90, 90 columns of information about each user. I Conveniently, I don't, I don't think I did this on purpose. I'm not sure how lucky I am that it came back this way. But our open side is the Twitter handle for our open side, which is the author of our tweet that, that I'm using right now. So that's kind of fun. Um, and then a bunch of other people that um, I happen to follow on Twitter. And one of the things that you get in this particular data frame is the last tweet that they sent. Okay, so not their whole timeline but one representative recent tweet for each person who I looked up. 
Uh, and you can, what could be included in there just to go back to, um, sorry, I forget who asked, but geographic information, let's do a glimpse on this and see if, um, how many people have, whether or not we can find any people who have geographic information. I don't see any right off the bat. There also might be geographic information in the, um, in their profile. Uh, but in any case, we'll get to that. All right, so that was get rehydrating more information on the users. And then you can do the same thing on followers. Uh, so who's, I think this is right, who's following me? Yep. So if I run that, and by the way, there are sometimes permission issues that you'll run into. You can't necessarily uh, get all of this information for people, for other people. Uh, some of it you can, some of it you can't. But if I run that and I find out who's following me, and then I look up the users on those user IDs, uh, then I can display that data. And here's a bunch of people who have, uh, for whatever reason, decided they wanted to follow me. And, and this should be the last tweet that they sent, right? Full of all kinds of funky stuff. Like, of course, that's a Twitter handle. And uh, that slash n, if you haven't seen it before, is, is a character, or it actually stands for new line, which is essentially a carriage return or an enter key, um, and then other things. All of that, it's the same 90 columns. All right, so one thing that's really interesting is the get timelines. So you can get timeline information on any one individual. There is an individual named Brianna Gibbons. Giddens, I don't know if any of you know of her, but she's pretty famous uh, musician who uh, I believe she went to high school in Greensboro. And uh, so I'm gonna get a timeline on her and Greensboro, North Carolina. And I'm gonna get a timeline on her and limit the, the timeline to 3,200. And let's see, that might take a while to run and I'm pretty certain in the console I've got a progress bar. Hey John, what does 3,200 stand for again? Yeah, that's just limiting to how many tweets I'm going to return. Okay. Um, so you can change that name. And just uh, as long as you ask that question, let me zoom back out. Uh, just let me remind folks that if you're not sure what arguments and functions you can, what arguments or how you can use a function, you can always highlight that function, get timeline and hit F1. And uh, that kind of information should then exist in the documentation. So if I scroll down here, n equals number of tweets to return per timeline. And then, of course, one other way would be go directly to the RTweet website where they have that same information online. So, um, I, so I got that timeline back, and I could look at it. It should look pretty similar to you at this point, uh, 90 columns. But in this case, uh, 3,196 rows returned which is pretty close to 3,200, right? There's four, four of them missing for whatever reason. And um, then what I think I'd like to do, what I'd like to find out right now is, well, since it's this is referred to as a timeline, is what's the range upon which uh, Rihanna has been tweeting, right? So I'm just gonna take the minimum value of the created at uh, variable and the maximum value, which are both dates. Uh, there's created that right there. And that just really simply allows me, that's tidy version right there, right? That's not, that's, that's uh, deplier, not our tweet. And what I can read from that is that Rihanna has been uh, tweeting from uh, October, late October, 2015, right up until uh, today, as a matter of fact. Um, 1647, I'm not sure what time zone. Actually, I think she lives in Scotland at the moment. I'm not certain about that. Um, uh, and then, all right, so there's my range. That's just for my own personal information. I was just curious. So let's just visualize that, right? Let's visualize her timelines. Um, there is, I just want to double check. Yeah, this thing right here called TS plot is, um, an R tweet function that stands for time series plot. 
And then I, and that actually turns back a ggplot uh, visualization, which you can see right there. It did everything for me. And then since it happens to be a ggplot visualization, I can then follow that with a whole bunch of ggplot um, functions to make it look however I want in ggplot. So that's a really handy thing. That's the exact same graph, just tweaked to be um, more to my liking. And I'm gonna change one more thing because I want Leona Gibbons legend to be, let's see, we're not at the bottom, but the top. And um, so that's a really nice feature. Not only can you easily visualize the timeline, but you can, if you've learned ggplot, you can easily modify that visualization. Um, let's see. All right, so another thing that I can do is I can do get favorites because people on Twitter can favorite a tweet. So uh, I'll use the Rihanna Gibbons handle and, and see what are, if there's 3,000 things that she's favorited, I'll, I'll pull all those back. And I bet there's not 3,000. Turns out there's uh, 412. And again, very similar to what we've seen before, uh, 90 columns. I'm not sure what, they, what the one extra column is in this case. Maybe it's the favorites. Um, and it might be at the end. I'm curious about that just right now. So I'm going to, I'm just going to run this glimpse and see if I can see something, yeah, favorited by. I got strapped, got strapped out of the end there, uh, favorited by Rihanna Gibbons, which is not actually particularly useful information in this one case. But if I was going to combine it with something else, I would want to know who's favoriting what. Um, so there's Rihanna Gibbons, Gibbons favorites. Um, another thing you can do is you can search for users' profiles, right? So there's this search users tag. And uh, what I'm going to search here is this phrase Gullah. Um, the Gullah is a, is a I'm not, maybe not, I might, I might not get the, this definition exactly right because I'm not, I don't study languages, but it is a, either a pidgin form of English, uh, but it's, it's not strictly English and it's spoken down in the coastal communities of um, North America, uh, specifically to slave populations, um, enslaved peoples who didn't initially give up their, their language and turned it into something unique. It's called Gullah. And uh, so I'm going to search anybody who's got Gullah in their profile. And once again, return. I'm, 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 you don't have to put in the n equals 1,000. I'm just doing that to make sure that these, these searches don't run on forever. Um, and so I, now I have that in an object name called Gullah. And if I return that, uh, I get 500 rows where these particular screen names have Goa in somewhere in their profile, which if I knew where that was in this, it might be actually a list, but uh, we could probably find it. But it's not all that important. It's gonna be one of these variables. And it's not gonna be in their most recent tweet necessarily, right? Like it's not there. It's just in their Twitter handle profile. Um, Another thing you can do is you can search on trends. So you can, in that case, it takes a location. Um, so at that point, I, um, I was just curious whether or not uh, we could get back trends for Greensboro. I myself have not found that this particular feature all that handy, um, but, and I'm not even certain that I'm using it right, to be honest with you, but that's what it's supposed to do. So I might need to double check the documentation on that. But now let's talk about location information, going back to what um, somebody had asked. So in order to use location information, I'm going to bring in a whole other package, this package called uh, Tidy Geocoder. And you can get a link there to the Tidy Geocoder package that you can run, and there's documentation there. But basically, I'm going to start with uh, this Twitter data, Rihanna Gibbons' timeline. Right. If I display that, and then I'm gonna, you know, drop any NAs and place names and 
and select just certain variables and then take only the distinct rows where that exists, I'm going to get back these, this now list of 16 rows where Rihanna Giddens specifically named some place name, probably some place name where she's performed. Uh, I actually haven't gone back to look at the tweets. And then what I did is I created a new variable called address, which should be over here. Uh, where did it go? Oh, I haven't run that yet. Um, which is going to be um, specifically formatted so I can send this phrase to the tidy geocoder library. And when I run that whole thing, uh, it's going to go out and look at each one of those place names and return for me the latitude and longitude of the place name that was identified. So uh, it can sometimes take a little bit of time because it's got to go, it's basically orchestrating a whole nother API uh, at a whole nother site. And it's specifically using the open, open street maps um, geocoding database. And it returns these last two columns for me that I didn't have before, latitude and longitude. And once I have latitude and longitude, I can then map those locations. Because there's location information in lots of places, right? There's a place name, there's a full place name, there's a city place type or a POI. I'm not sure what that stands for, political something. Um, country, country code. Uh, what's the best thing to gather? And then there's also potentially information in a person's profile. And that was the question was, was you know, how do you how do you assess that? And I honestly don't know. I think what you're going to find, what I have found when I have looked at, into this, is that first of all, there's a whole lot of um, missing information because not everybody wants Twitter to report where they're tweeting from if you're trying to locate that. And the other is there's very little chance that you can verify that whatever place name they're identifying is real. It could just be, you know, like some kind of Twitter ruse. Um, so I'm not sure how you identify what's best. But once you get that information and you send it to Tidy Geocoder, you get back the latitude and longitude. And once you get back the latitude and longitude, right, you can visualize it. And in this case, I'm visualizing it with ggplot, um, some code that I'm pretty certain I got off of the RTweet website. And all it's doing is identifying um, these places where Rihanna Gibbons has performed. I'm pretty certain that's why she mentioned them. Uh, she's a very accomplished vocalist, I think opera singer, and among other things. And um, uh, I thought it was kind of interesting that she, that Greensboro, North Carolina would show up in this list of these other uh, places that are probably better known for their uh, performance halls. Any case, uh, here's another example. So that was Rihanna Gibbons' timeline and places that she mentioned. But I did the same thing for that Gullet set of tweets. Same exact procedure, uh, just to see for people who had identified Gullet in their profiles, um, where we could where we could visualize where they are. And I got back very few responses some duplicate information and some stuff that I couldn't easily look up a geocoder location on. Uh, but if I, if I visualize those using another uh, mapping technique, in this case, I get uh, Queens, New York, Atlanta, Georgia, and Los Angeles. Uh, and I probably could change a variable to get a few more. Sorry, change an argument to get a few more displays. At this point, I just want to mention, I, I know I've done some rather quick visualizations and gotten into some mapping visualizations that you may not have uh, seen or followed. So I just want to um, go back here to our fun, if I can, and point out, where did our fun get to? There it is, that there is, at least one 
workshop on mapping right here. And not only that, but if I go all the way down to the bottom uh, and I'm gonna go to, to my center, Data Visualization Sciences. Why did that not happen? Oh, I'm gonna click on this globe and click on online learning because we might, you might find that um, that the 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 R mapping live uh, video that's under that's here is more useful because that's done by um, I'm not sure I might be referring to that one on the R fun site, but this one is definitely done by Drew Keener, and he's a GIS specialist, whereas I am not, so he might be able to cover some of the details better than I could of how you do uh, mapping in R and uh, geospatial analysis. So um, what I thought I would do, I should pause here and make sure that I didn't, if I covered something too fast, if you have an opportunity to ask a question, uh, feel free to either unmic or put it in, put it in chat and I'm, I really am going to pause. I'm going to keep on chatting unless you say something out loud, in which case I'll stop talking. Um, but if there's nothing that comes in, I'm going to get into uh, text analysis of these tweets. Um, I have a question. Um, being a relatively new R user, what's the what is like using R Markdown versus R Script like a preference, or um, is it easier for Twitter? Uh, it's a preference. Uh, when I teach R, I always teach with R Markdown, but you can create generate scripts in many ways. You can just do an R script. You can do an R notebook. R notebooks, R Markdown are, are essentially the same thing. And they're both examples of what's called literate coding. So that um, what you can do is you can integrate your prose or natural language with your code chunks. And uh, I'm actually, wasn't intending to, but inadvertently I'll demonstrate because the next um, script I'm going to run through is this one called analyze with tidytext.rmd, right? This is this is that script right here. It starts O2. When you have an R markdown script and you run the whole thing by clicking on preview, you can generate different kinds of outputs. Could be slides, could be websites, could be web pages, could be PDF documents, or um, just the list goes on. And that's useful because uh, I may want to use my same analysis, but get a different kind of output. And I don't want to have to necessarily do a whole lot of um, copying and pasting or retyping because all of those things create opportunities for, for uh, typos and then failures. But as I said, this, this line right here decides what, when you run the script, how is it going to be rendered? In this case, it's an HTML notebook. So right here has the, basically the exact same name, but it ends in .mb.html for notebook.html. And it's a self-contained HTML document that you could send to somebody like you would send a PDF or a Word file. Word, Microsoft Word is another output option. And then, uh, and then here you can see how the natural language is rendered in a more elegant way, right? So I haven't actually got a whole lot of natural language in this document. I've got some, uh, but that's why I do it because um, it enables me to keep my analysis right in the same file with my, with my um, prose. And then if my data changes, I can change my prose to, to reflect how I want to explain that that analysis change, or if my analysis changes, if I keep it all in one place, it's more likely to be reproducible in the future. Hi, John, I had a question. Um, could Hi, you Brenda. repeat what you said about like the limitations that the Twitter API puts on retrieving tweets? Like if I put in a hashtag that's very popular and I set it as n equals a thousand, how does it choose to sample those tweets? Yeah, I actually don't know the answer to that question, Brenda. It's a great question. I'm glad you asked it. Um, I've just never, I've never looked into exactly what it is. It is definitely, you're correct, that it is a sample. I wish I had mentioned that earlier. Um, and 
there, as I have understood it in the past, particularly when you didn't have the academic access, there was no way to guarantee that that sample would be the same sample if you ran it again, right? So for example, anytime you run a statistical analysis where you're setting a random number to use as a seed, right, you can record that random number and get the same results. But as far as I know, you cannot do that with Twitter data. So you just have to collect the data that you can and you keep that data around with the IDs and then you rehydrate them as necessary. If you rehydrate the IDs, you'll get the same data. But as far as getting the same tweet population, I don't, I don't know that you can guarantee that. I don't think that you can, but I, I wanna recognize my own limitation here as not being a Twitter scholar. Um, if that's possible, I just, I'm just unaware of it. Um, the other thing to point out again is, the, is that if you apply for that academic access, you're gonna have the ability to get more data and so by having more data, maybe you can, I would have to look into it, and I'm sure you would too. Um, you, could, you could at least set up some barriers to ensure that that, that consistency exists. And for what it's worth, I looked at the academic link that you put, which is the correct link, but it's not loading on Twitter. Oh. Like when you click comply, like from Twitter, it doesn't go anywhere. So I don't you, know if that's, I'll check later and see if they fix it. Uh, I'm glad you said that. I'm, it makes me initially wonder if you have a developer account because there's, so it's sort of almost like three steps to my understanding is one, you get a Twitter account, two, you get a developer account, which is free. And then three, you, you apply for your developer account to be an academic. So that may explain why it's not working if you don't have the developer account yet. That's helpful, thank you. We'll run through this, an example of text mining. So, um, this document exists in that repository that I shared with you. And as an NBHTML file, you can load it in your web browser and read it. And at the top is a link to that text mining book that I mentioned, which is online and free, right? You can scroll through it. There's a really important section right here on analyzing word and document frequencies. Uh, but all of these chapters are relatively brief and concise. Ngrams is an important concept. Sentiment analysis is an important concept. Uh, the book gives you practice data. If you're interested, the practice data is all of the Jane Austen novels, which um, are just amazing novels if you haven't read them. And if you have read them, it's even more fun to go through the process because you, you know, basically you get to quantify things that you already know um, about these very popular novels. Um, but also I wanna point out that, oh, there's also an important section here on topic modeling which is all of these are just introductions. Um, uh, they're very complex topics in, in general, but case uh, chapter seven, case studies on comparing Twitter archives is very useful. Now I'm gonna run through this as the report rather than live coding because the Twitter data changes constantly and there's some visualizations that I want you to see just as demonstrations. And if I, if I gather the Twitter data live in real time, I might not get, I might, it would take longer and I couldn't necessarily guarantee that I was gonna be able to show you what I want you to see. So um, in this case, we're just gonna read the report, but in any case, the um, same two libraries are vitally important, Tidyverse and Rtweet, and then uh, TidyText for text mining. And we're gonna make a word cloud. I'll, I'll, I have a caveat about word clouds. Um, some people hate them, some people, a lot of people hate them, some people love them. Um, and I'm just gonna show them to you because it's it's easy to do and it, it, it's visually interesting anyway. But the first thing I did is I searched for some tweets uh, on a particular topic. Uh, there's a, there is a um, online game that um, my son and his girlfriend showed me that you can play on your phone called Among Us. Um, I don't know if you've played it. It's kind of fun. It's a little bit like um, Wink. And it, the reason why, it, I picked it as because I was looking for something that wouldn't, you know, when you're searching Twitter, you can get all kinds of garbage back. I didn't want to, I didn't want to put that on the screen if I could help it. Um, but I found a hashtag called Among Us Art, and it's it's really kind of it's fun little style of art that's sort of hand drawn. So that was the hashtag I searched. I don't have it recorded here, but it is at least it didn't display here because I didn't display the code for that. Uh, and then I got back several um, 
the same 90 columns that you're expecting, in this case, a thousand rows um, and several users all tweeting on Among Us part. Um, hey, I question. I'm, I'm having, I don't know how to access this uh, HTML doc. Like I'm trying to uh, click the link and it just give me like random code and I'm not sure what to do. So here's what you do. Um, if you downloaded from GitHub, mm -hmm. uh, which is this repository, right? Yep. You download and unzip. Oh, Make sure okay. you do both. And then once you unzip, open up the slides directory and uh, double click on the index.html. Unless it. you unzip it locally, um, it won't actually display properly on, on GitHub, right? Uh, oops, that's not the right, not sorry, I, I said that wrong. It's not the slides directory, uh, but it's the same issue. Yep. Um, if you open it here and view raw, it's just gonna show you raw HTML and, and a bunch of embedded stuff that you don't really care about. But if you download it, um, it'll, it'll display just fine in your web browser. Yep, all right, I got it. Okay, great. So we are here. All right, so uh, I, did, I did a search on Among Us art, A-R-T. And the first thing I did, uh, I, this is actually, um, this, I first did this, um, this code, I first composed this about maybe four or five months ago. And it didn't completely clean it up, but it still demonstrates the same thing. It exposes the same issues. So once I got my data back, uh, one of the things I did is I filtered for is retreat and I said false. Of course, I could have done that in the search that was up here. And then the other thing I did is under the text and the hashtag variables, I um, removed some terms because originally before I did today, and this is, and I, before I did it for this week, I was doing some searches on um, election stuff. And there was a whole lot of just spam coming back. And I found these two um, hashtags that were especially spammy. And so using this, these deplier techniques, I made sure that I could eliminate any text variables or hashtag variables that had those particular terms. Um, now, fortunately, the Among Us Spark uh, search returns back some really clean, wholesome, great stuff. And, uh, these, of course, don't have any effect because those terms don't exist there, but I didn't find anything that I needed to eliminate anyway. I didn't look all that closely, uh, but now you have a technique, right? If there's stuff that you want to get rid of, you can, you can do it something like this using, in this case, the stringer function called string detect. Uh, and so if you proceed that with the bang, that basically says uh, filter where uh, well, maybe actually, because it has the bang, that must be, that's negating that. I don't round remember exactly, but I think if I read that right, maybe it came back only with election night things. That makes more sense. Sorry, I had it initially wrong in my head, but I, it's because I didn't see that. In any case, that's deplier stuff. That's not, that's not Twitter stuff. So if it doesn't make sense, just reach out to me and I'll, I'll explain it better. Uh, and I got back this data frame, same kind of thing that we're used to seeing at this point, 90 columns, uh, in this case, 225 rows. And then what I, what I want to do now is I want to do what's called tokenizing. This is part of the um, tidy text um, approach where I'm just going to give a line number to every, uh, to every um, tweet. And then, um, actually, that's not entirely that's not entirely important there, but that's what happens. And then I just count that up. And so what I can see is that this person, this Twitter handle, they tweeted thirty three times, and this Twitter person tweeted twelve times, and so forth. Uh, and that's going to be really handy for the text analysis going forward. Then what I did is I created. Um, Here's where I was doing more of what I expected. Um, doing more filtering, creating a, um, a data frame called bad hashtags, things that I didn't want to create. Because down here, 
I'm going to do an anti-join with my clean data and the collection of things that were bad. Again, it had no effect on this particular data frame, but there are techniques that you may want to repeat in the future. And that would have, uh, if I wasn't doing Among Us, that would have reduced my, my totals to even shorter but cleaner uh, corpus of data that I want to, to analyze. And there's a little explanation coming straight out of the Tidrick text uh, book about uh, how you can do various um, anti-joins and filters and string text to do things. Um, stop words are a big thing. I don't know uh, if you're familiar with the term stop words or not. It's, it's a concept in natural language processing, text mining, text analysis, uh, words that are not particularly important, right? Like all the articles mean the English language, like A and the, uh, et cetera. And you can, you can customize your stop word list. Uh, there, there are dictionaries of stop word lists by language. So you definitely want to use one for whatever language you're actually um, analyzing as well. You might, particularly since it's Twitter, there may be other terms that you want to add to your stop word dictionary. And then once, and once you do that, um, you can remove those stop words from your, from your overall um, corpus. And what you get back is a listing of every word and who it's associated with. So in this case, a uh, user called, I don't know how we pronounce it, Isargi2 uh, on line four tweeted the word, or on tweet four tweeted the word among us. And you know, for every, we have this index of each tweet, right? So there's tweet five right there. And we know that all of the words in this column from among us down to this URL belong to this one tweet. So we're keeping a context of what the words, how the words relate to which tweets so that we can analyze them better. Later, here's a, another example of stop words. I'll just point out that there are a couple different ways to do stop words, particularly when you're doing tweets. And it has to do with the fact that, you know, uh, tweet data just is very messy, right? You can have hashtags in front of things. You can have uh, these at symbols in front of things indicating that it's a user ID. Um, and there are things that you just want to take out of your text so that you can analyze it better. And so I have a couple of different examples of how to um, uh, how to clean up your data. And then what I'm doing here is calculating the word frequency. So the word frequency is, uh, you know, what's the username? Uh, what's the word? And then uh, this was this nice little um, calculation showed up in the in the tidy textbook. Uh, I didn't come up with this, and I don't think I ever would have. Uh, but in any case, counting the number of words in a tweet versus the total number of words um, that uh, that this person has tweeted, because they may have tweeted more than once, and then for every every word you get a frequency score, which allows you to uh, plot that. In this way, uh, basically, this is the whole goal here: is that we have a word, and then what we do is we uh, it says up here spread, which is a function to turn long data into wider data. I use the pivot wider function, which is the modern version of spread. Um, and so I took this data up here, and then if we scroll to the right, here's the first user, here's the second user, here's the third user, or Twitter handle. And every word, that first word is the first row, has a different word frequency uh, index, right? And that's what we're going to end up plotting. So we may want to plot, uh, we're just going to plot two users, Sakurai, I don't know how to, Sakurai Yamazaki and Hina Yamazaki. And the reason why I picked those two is because they appear to have, if every row is a word, they appear to have several words in common, right? Unlike uh, if you if you look at here this SRG2, right? SRG2 has three scores for for this this these three words, these three rows, but uh, this character, this tweeter does not share those words. So they're really only between the two of them, they're really only sharing two words. Um, so that's something you can play with, you know, how to get your, your frequency table 
right? And then how to, and which people you're going to choose to compare. The more you know about the population, the more likely you're going to come up with the right kind of comparison. I know next to nothing about this population, so it was a little bit of a challenge. Uh, we're going to plot that. I'm going to skip all the way down here to here. And there is an example of the first tweeter and the second tweeter and their index scores plotted on an XY axis as word frequency percentages. And uh, I'll be perfectly honest with you, this is, this is where I know, and it's very clear to me that I am not a text analysis uh, scholar because I'm not exactly certain how to interpret that other than to look at it, but it's, again, I just want to expose you to ways that you can analyze tweets or compare users. Um, if I scroll up, uh, I'm going to scroll up and just show you some simpler ways to visualize things. I mentioned that some people hate word clouds, but if you wanted to, if you wanted to make a word cloud, you could take that same tokenized tweets, count up the words, use that as a weighting mechanism, and then display your word cloud like this. Um, I, I recently heard Professor Chris Bale say, uh, "Friends don't let friends create word clouds," which I thought was. You know, a lot that's very cute, but also represents the kind of way many people hate word clouds in sort of a similar way to if you're into if you study visualization, many people hate pie charts. And um, I would take a slightly more agnostic view on that, that there can be reasons to use these visualizations, and you should probably think clearly about why you might use them. Uh, my reasoning was that this was easy to generate, and it clearly shows you that at least among this population after it's sorted out uh, which words were used most frequently. But what it doesn't show you is the importance of those words, right? How do, how do they relate to one another? Um, another way to show frequency of words that is, I think, more descriptive than this word cloud, but not as pretty, is to just do a frequency bar chart and display it that way. And you can get a sense of the rel relative importance of this Among Us art uh, hashtag to some of these others, right? Which makes sense because Among Us Art was the search that I actually did and all the rest of these hashtags and words just showed up in the tweets as a result. Um, one more example there where I'm using the anti-join on stop words, but let's keep going. Uh, section on word usage. So I took my tweets and I got a sense of the range of the timeline range. Same thing I was doing with Rihanna Gibbons back in the other script. And what I'm doing here is creating word ratios to find out um, how often each of these Twitter handle users uses a particular kind of word so that I can compare them and create a ratio in this case, it's just those two, those same two Twitter handle users, right? I, I, I've uh, subset the data in such a way that I'm just looking at those two users and then created a ratio of each word that they're using with a negative and positive score. And then essentially I can create a, a nice chart like this where I can see that um, the, the Twitter handle user that's represented in kind of a pink red uses the word cool logarithmically more often, way more often than um, uh, the Twitter handle user represented in blue, who uses, the, who uses the word cat way more often, right? That's their most popular word. Another thing that's popular, that's, that's most overrepresented are these URLs that I should have, I should have cleaned my data a little bit because that, that probably was not all that useful. But um, it's one more way of looking at analyzing, visualizing, representing tweets. And uh, then that brings us to a couple other sections, things that you could learn about. I didn't, I didn't write out the code for these, but there are links for these that go straight to that book that I was mentioning. So you can, there are ways to understand and visualize favorites and retweets, ways to understand and visualize changes in words. But I wanted to introduce to you this idea of, of a document term matrix or a term document matrix and also an inverse document matrix. Um, this, these are common sort of approaches in, in uh, I can't get my, uh, 
uh, current approaches in text analysis. And so term frequency and then inverse document frequency are basically ways to identify what words are important and weight words that are used rarely and possibly devalue words that are used real frequently like, like uh, stop words, again, leading articles and things like that. Um, and then ultimately, uh, you can sort of adjust for how rarely, how rarely a word is used. Uh oh, I lost my screen. I didn't mean to do that. There we go. Hopefully, you can still see it. Um, and then you can, and then you can visualize that. So, all in an attempt. There's a link right there that, where you can read more about um, TTFIDF. But once you run through those kinds of screenings and calculations. You can end up with um, here's a, a here's a calculation on the frequency of the term among us uh, by this one user, and then uh, here is what am I doing here? Grouping by user, getting a summary of the total number of words used, and then once I do that, I can combine those into one table using a join. And once I have both of those columns represented for each word, I can then uh, use this function. This, this is a very complicated function. It's not complicated to use, but it's complicated to understand and represent. And again, this gets into the scholarly aspect of um, text analysis. But this TDIDF variable and the TF variable and the IDF variable, all, all those are the ones I want to calculate. I can do that with that function right there, bind TF, IDF. And in the end, I can get um, a chart sort of like this, which shows or should show the words that are considered most important by these four users in this case and how they might relate to each other. So I, I have to tell you that I, I tell you all of this with a bit of sheepishness because uh, the more I study how I can make R do these things, the more I realize how little I understand about text analysis, right? It's, it really is a quite a rich field and a quite a dynamic field. And I wanna encourage you to, to go way beyond what I'm doing if you're gonna use this in your scholarship. Um, I, since I don't, I don't publish articles, it's not necessarily important for me. My goal is to expose you to the resources. And so check out that book, uh, check out the resources at Chris Bale's site. SCISS.io. And you will be on your way to learning much more about text analysis. But um, we have about 10 minutes left, and I don't really have anything more to say, but I am happy to answer questions if anybody has any. And I also want to encourage you, by the way, uh, if you want to, if you want to talk about how this relates to a specific research project. Uh, beyond just surface level questions, you might want to uh, reach out to me for a consultation where we can spend an hour kind of really digging in on aspects. But, but in terms of general questions or clarifications, it's uh, open mic or open time, throw something into the chat. In the meantime, I, I see that I have been ignoring chats that came in. So uh, if anybody asks a question, go ahead. And then I, if not, I will try to read some questions. Okay, I see that, um, I'm not sure how to pronounce it, but Ghoul, who has, has been here before, was giving some information on how to, how to read raw HTML files that show up on GitHub. And Fahim wrote, um, not related to tweet though, I see there is an argument in the pivot wider function as values equals fill zero. What does that mean? That's a great question, uh, Fahim. What that means is when you're pivoting your data from tall to wide, um, if, there are, if there are empty values, uh, you can assign them or you can fill them with something. So I, I didn't do that, but if you, um, I'm pretty certain, let's see if I can do this. I'm gonna go in here and type uh, pivot, pivot wider and hit F1. Oh, that didn't work. Um, why did that not work? I'm going to go over here to help and type pivot wider. So from, from this documentation, what's, what is, can be helpful is that there is some practice data fish encounters and 
U.S. rent, and there may even be an example of, uh, let's see if there's a values. Yeah, right, well, there's a values function, values fill. Uh, okay. Here's an example right there in that code. You can try that out just to see how it works. That bit of code. Uh, fish encounters would be a data set that is now on your, if you run uh, this library that it comes from, which is TidyR, I think, um, might be Deplier, yeah, it's TidyR, then fish encounters will exist and you can run that sample code and try it out. Okay, so that's, uh, that's everything I've got for you, but I wanna, again, make space in case you wanna ask a question out loud.